Hello, I'm Lisa Gudermuth. I'm the program manager at Ranking Digital Rights and an associated researcher at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. And tonight I will talk to you about um, the project Ranking Digital Rights Corporate Accountability Index. Uh, so we rank 22 of the world's largest internet and telecommunications companies on their respect for privacy and freedom of expression. So this is the map of the 2018 index. You can see a few familiar companies on there. There's Apple and Facebook and Microsoft and Twitter. Uh, in Europe, we have the, uh, some telecommunications companies, Vodafone, Orange, Telefonica, uh, but we're also worldwide, so uh, all try to be as, as broad as possible. Um, and so we rank also Russian companies and Chinese companies and uh, Middle Eastern companies, all under the same methodology. Um, we don't have Deutsche Telekom yet, but um, it, it might be coming soon, actually. Um, so before I really begin, I would also like to start uh, by posing the question of, um, you've gotten the information from me thus far that we rank internet and telecommunications companies on their respect for privacy and freedom of expression, on their digital rights, um, but then I'd like to ask what, what people have as ideas of what are your digital rights or, or was sind digitale Rechte, what, what comes to mind when you think of that? You can just shout it out. No? Okay. <laughs> well, I have uh, some examples to you. I've, uh, owner rights. Ah, okay. This is, this is interesting. Like, yes, uh, like controlling uh, your data as well, and yes, and having uh, the ability to download it. Uh, so what I'll do, uh, because it's a, a vast index, or what I've, how I framed the talk, is just by talking about a few of the indicators specifically to get, uh, get an idea of what we consider uh, and measure as digital rights. Um, so the, f oop, the first indicator I'll go over is the um, just collection of user information. And a lot of these will seem very basic, and they indeed are, actually, uh, in, in our view. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, clear questions of, does the company clearly disclose what types of user information it collects? Uh, for each type of user information the company collects, does it clearly disclose how it collects that user information? Um, and also, this is 2017 data. I should have said that uh, we've had three indexes thus far, uh, one in 2015, 2017, and just recently launched our 2018 data. And I will get to some of the uh, most recent data, um, and I wanted to be able to demonstrate actually some of the improvements that companies have made. Um, so yeah, this is a uh, collection of user information, very clear. Uh, sharing of user information. For each type of user information the company collects, does it clearly disclose whether it shares that in user information? So kind of a level up, uh, if you would. But um, you can already see, I mean, this graph is, and, and the previous one is also good for showing that uh, you can see that Kakao is a, a Korean company, a South Korean uh, internet company, and they're performing the best here with 79%, still not 100%, but uh, you see also that Google and Apple are then below 50%, and so there's a lot of room for improvement, and also when you uh, conduct a study like this, you end up um, seeing companies that can act as examples in, in certain areas. So other companies can actually look to them and at their disclosures and say, oh, actually, uh, not only is this possible, but I have a, a way to look uh, to, to improve my disclosures in that direction. Um, so here's uh, two indicators that are representative of our freedom of expression uh, indicators. Um, so these are and this is now 2018 data, um, it's process for terms of service enforcement and data about terms of service enforcement. And what does that mean? Um, for process of terms of service em uh, enforcement, it's uh, said shortly, it's uh, are they clearly communicating uh, what their community guidelines are, what their rules are. Um, we've seen a lot of imp improvements on this indicator over the years um, and also even before the index started it was a lot kind of worse uh, where platforms were not clear about what was allowed and what not was not allowed and a lot of content was taken down and uh, and accounts were cancelled and a lot of confused and angry people or endangered people or um, yeah so that's kind of a, um, a ground a ground rules freedom of expression indicator and then 
the uh, fourth freedom of expression indicator is data about terms of service enforcement is very interesting and timely this year because um, it's about transparency reporting. So not only are you clear about the rules that you're running your platform on, but you're also reporting how many takedowns you've had in the last uh, year or, or what types of content you're, you're taking down. Um, and so there's still like considerably less disclosure on that indicator, but actually this year, just before the 2018 index launch, both YouTube and Facebook uh, made some really big steps, and, and uh, I'll show actually at the end uh, a, s a screenshot of the transparency reports in this area. So this is something that we're seeing develop in, in, uh, in the same way that government uh, requests for user data trans are, are reflected in transparency reports kind of across the board. We'll see this uh, more often. Um, so those are a few indicators. So like as a summary, um, we look at public disclosures and policies. Um, we do not do technical testing, um, but we welcome partnerships and have done many partnerships uh, where people couple technical testing with the methodology. Um, we rank 22 internet, uh, mobile, and telecommunications companies based and used by people all over the world, and it's 35 indicators in the areas of governance, freedom of expression, and privacy. And that's the URL as well, and you can explore it, uh, the most recent index in detail. Um, so I'll just keep moving along here. Um, so this is another privacy indicator, which is... Uh, data breaches. So this is the 2017 uh, data, and this is like really basic. It's in the news all the time. Yahoo had a massive data breach a, p a, a few years ago, Equifax in the United States. Um, it, it happened, I mean, Facebook, it's kind of uh, debated whether there was an actual data breach by definition, but uh, data was shared uh, unreasonably. Um, and this is, it kind of speaks for itself, is none of the companies that we evaluated in 2017 had any disclosure uh, in their terms of service or privacy policy or any public facing documents about, I mean, making the most basic commitments to inform their users uh, when there was a data breach. Um, so, and a few telecommunications companies did, uh, as you can see. And um, so this is the 2018 data, the most recent data, and we're seeing a little bit more um, of uh, disclosure and actually Vodafone, this is an example where uh, we, we can kind of assume or imagine that Vodafone kind of took the methodology and used it uh, and said, okay, these are actually not that difficult things to implement and implemented and went from their score last year to 100%. Um, and hopefully we'll see kind of both with the general data protection uh, regulation and uh, kind of more examples being shown in the space, uh, more disclosure around data breaches is still obviously very poor. Um, and so methodologies are not only useful for evaluations, but if done properly, they can be roadmaps for companies. So I haven't really stressed this that much thus far uh, in the presentation, but um, just as much as it's a research project and uh, the results are useful for other researchers and advocacy groups and policymakers and so on, uh, we really are not a project that seeks to be uh, only a watchdog organization. We actually, our goal is, uh, or like one of the, the things we strive to do is actually work with companies and uh, make sure that they know the methodology and how to improve their disclosures. And it's uh, been really interesting because a lot of the time, um, you know, the look at the methodology and realize, oh, I didn't realize I could make this, uh, this improvement that would improve my respect of privacy or freedom of expression. Or as, as mentioned before, they'll see uh, a company from the results uh, that has done better than them and look to their uh, disclosures to see how they can kind of copy and build off of it. Um, and this is uh, the year-on-year -year score changes from 2017 to 2018. Uh, so from it just in that one year, we saw 17 of the 22 companies make net improvements um, in various areas. Um, so, but it's like the aggregate improvement. Um, and then uh, this is just a little bit more contextual information about uh, the data of terms of service informant uh, 
terms of service enforcement um, with the YouTube community guidelines and how they're, they're doing transparency reporting. Um, and then I'll just close with talking about a little bit more of the collaborations uh, that Franking Digital Rights has done. So um, in the area of Internet of Things, uh, we have, I mentioned technical testing before. This is actually a collaboration where we're working with Consumer Reports, which is the equivalent of Stiftung Warentest in the US. Uh, and we are doing kind of the portion of work that is looking at disclosures and commitments of the companies and then working with technical partners that are uh, kind of coming together to, uh, to then rank Internet of Things products uh, on a holistic kind of, uh, it's not a ranking, but a score or, you know, Stiftung uh, Warentest test yeah, scale. Um, and then there's also local and regional adaptations of our work. So the methodology is readily uh, open to the public and available in Creative Commons, and we've seen a lot of people pick this up. So the city of New York City did a ranking of their internet service providers uh, on their respect for privacy. Um, and then the dependent yet disenfranchised is a, a report of Middle Eastern telecommunications companies that all did applied the methodology there as well. So uh, with that, open up for questions. <laughs>